Welcome back. I hope everyone has had a moment to um, look at and understand and reflect on what um, you heard during the various keynote sessions and breakout sessions today. I also hope you've had a chance to uh, nourish yourselves, to get a good bite to eat, hydrate yourself, get, get some fluid in you, um, because we were about to move into the last session of the Racial Justice Summit. What a day of learning and stretching it has been. For those of you who are joining us for the first time today, I want to welcome you to the Salvation Army Racial Justice Summit here in the Central Territory. I am Major Catherine Clausell, the Social Justice and Urban Mission Secretary here in the Central Territory, and your host for the Racial Justice Summit. I encourage you to prepare your hearts and minds to be stirred up and spurred on to address the issues of racial justice. I also would like to welcome back um, those of you all who have been with us since 8.30 this morning or for any part of the day, because I understand people have full responsibilities as co-officers and staff, and I truly appreciate you taking the time out to, to come in as you were able to listen and to learn and to be hopefully inspired to think uh, deeply about issues of racial justice and how you might um, respond to what God might be saying to you about how to step into or why you should step into issues of racial justice at this time. Thank you for your continued commitment to learn more about racial justice and considering what God may be calling you to do. It is my hope that um, as a result of these two days together that you will have some idea as to how you might take deliberate action to dismantle, dismantle racism. So as I said, this is the last segment of the summit for today. So be sure to come back tomorrow morning at 8.30 a.m. Central Time for a time of worship and a message from Dr. Sung Chan Ra, who some of you all got to hear this morning during his um, uh, breakout session. And I know you were inspired and, and challenged and and a lot of consciousness raised around the issues that he talked about and, um, and be further challenged and, and inspired and encouraged um, by his message that he's prepared for us for tomorrow's worship service. The format for tomorrow will be pretty much the same as it was today, with uh, starting with the um, chapel service at 8.30, then moving into breakout sessions. Again, there will be three options. This time, the second day of the summit, this will be the part two of what you uh, received today. So those same topics, um, but part two for that. And then there will be a lunch talk back. So this is an opportunity for you to um, talk directly to some degree with the three keynote speakers. They will be on screen and I will again moderate that session. And uh, again, if you have any questions, I ask that you post those to either the um, Facebook group that we created. Uh, so get those questions in there. I'll be going through them, combing through them tonight. But also um, we will be lifting some of the questions that doesn't get asked during the breakout session, um, using them in the talkback session as well. So, and we will also have a Q&A um, box um, during that particular talkback session. So that's an opportunity to even put in fresh questions for us to ask our guests. So, so in addition tonight to the keynote address, which I'll take a moment um, to talk about again, to share a little bit of um, Major Marion Platt's bio, who's bringing us our dinner keynote. Um, you will be introduced to Lieutenant Colonels Laniel and Patty Richardson, um, the Central Territory's Diversity and Inclusion Secretaries. As we learned this morning, this is a new officer role in the Central Territory and an additional appointment for the Richardsons, who also serve as divisional commanders, divisional leaders of the Metropolitan Division, uh, which is headquarters in Chicago. So let's get started. 
with a word of prayer, and then um, there will be a video playing introducing you to the Richardsons. Father in heaven, I just thank you for your grace and your mercy and your great love and concern for us, your children. Thank you for this time that we have had together wrestling and contending with the issues of racial justice. There's been some great learning and some great li uh, listening displayed through the course of today. And I pray that you continue to speak to our hearts and reveal to us where we indeed can do better with respect to moving forward for a diverse, inclusive, and anti-racist army. Just continue to anoint your soldiers, your, your, this army, uh, that you have raised up specifically to meet the needs of the poor and the, the needy and the alien in our midst. Bless us and anoint us. Also hold us accountable when we fall short of, of your desire, what you have made clear to us that you want us to do and how you want us to be. Uh, but mostly continue to show us your grace and mercy for when we do fall short, because it truly is our heart's desire to fulfill your will, to see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And so, Father, as we um, enter into this last segment of our Racial Justice Summit, I just ask that you anoint the speaker who's bringing us his message tonight, a message that help, help us to continue to further our understanding about issues of racial justice, and, um, and just all the ways in which we can help and love each other better. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I think God leads us in strange ways uh, and prepare us for um, what it is he wants us to do. and and whether it's been unfortunate or God's leading, that we've been in a number of appointments where there have been a number of either community, uh, racial and justice issues that we had to address. And as the Salvation Army, we wanted to be part of a community that um, really looked at these issues seriously. Personally, that was very hard for me. Uh, you know, we knew George because he had worked at the Harbor Light, and so we had that, that connection. But as a, a, a parent, it's, I almost can't describe the pain in my heart that I felt uh, as I watched that and as I listened to what he had to say. It just, it just truly went to my core. And when we had our prayer walk, to see uh, salvationists of all ilks come along, and we walked along and we, and we spoke as a Salvation Army saying, that is not right, and we have to do better. When we were divisional leaders in Midland during Michael Brown incident in, in St. Louis, representing the Salvation Army, I was able to sit down with other religious leaders and leaders who wanted to bring that community together in a positive way, but wanting to do that in a way that also brought uh, a sense of not only awareness, but who we were as a Salvation Army. And it's a wonderful opportunity now for people to see a side of the Salvation Army that maybe a lot of people didn't know was there, and it should have been there all along. The fact that we care about the racial injustices and the inequities. It's not what has taken place, but our vision for what can happen in a community. Well, when we were called and told that we were gonna have this additional appointment, my first thought was like, wow. It just was, it was interesting in the fact that now we were actually gonna give officially some real attention to something that's been very impactful, uh, packed my life as an African-American officer, you know, for all these 40 some years. Things that um, myself and my colleagues had talked about, uh, now we were actually gonna bring them to the forefront and make them not just a conversation in our circle, we were gonna make them a conversation in our territory. I see being a part of cabinet uh, the commissioner and leadership saying there's a place for diversity at the table uh, and not just to uh, invitation there, but to take part in the conversation. Just being able to point out uh, little things and to make a comment or, or a suggestion or just to bring a, a point of view that is not normally heard. 
and hopefully doing that, obviously not just for the sake of making a comment, but for the sake of actually uh, making a difference. And so that together are, we're, we're doing better. We're doing the most good at the la you know, at the risk of sounding, you know, you know, cliche is, but we really are doing good with all the wonderful, diverse resources of people that we have. And I felt this was a very relevant time period for the Army to address these critical issues for our not only well-being as the Army, but more in line with who we are and where we serve with even in the territory. And so uh, when the Baileys uh, asked and uh, Commissioner Brad Bailey called, I knew it was part of his heart. I, I can't say that I would have said yes to any other uh, territorial commander because I would not have uh, seen it uh, being with the authenticity I knew of him. Uh, and so it was not just a position, but it was something that he really believed in and wanted to advance uh, the central territory in this direction of diversity and inclusion. Many of our soldiers and our employees deal with these issues on a daily basis and to have the Salvation Army recognize that this is important, but to have someone who can sit at the table and discuss these issues, we're doing it on their behalf. It is not simply uh, just me and Patty that we're bringing our, uh, our history, but we're representing employees and soldiers who for a long time have had to deal with these issues, uh, oftentimes in silence. Officers, uh, of color, my colleagues, we've listened and we've heard the stories and we've heard with other, with other soldiers and things like that. So now it's a chance for others in the territory to listen and to be okay if it makes you a little uncomfortable because it's in disturbing that status quo and that little uncomfortability that we can begin to think and to look and to see and then come up together with some strategies that maybe we can do to kind of address the issue. I think it will call for us to maybe have new tools in our toolkit uh, to prepare leaders uh, for encountering rough terrain. We have to be committed uh, to the journey and not turn back, not see the mountains or to encounter them and, and say they're too difficult to climb and so we head back without having our goal in mind. I couldn't agree with him uh, with more. I mean, this is indeed a journey. Um, we, we've navigated a long way as an army and we've got some hills to climb. So I'm hoping the conversations that we have around this will garner people who will go with us on that journey. And if we as a church uh, can lay aside our differences and really face the truth of who we are and what we're called to be, what better example uh, will we have for the rest of society? More importantly, as we in the Salvation Army can show the church, we are at a very exciting time in our territory. Uh, the new uh, cabinet members and positions that were brought on is individuals, Patty and I think, uh, along with some who's already been in place, who have a kindred spirit to want to see the territory move forward uh, in these areas of diversity and inclusion. And if we are going to truly grow our army, it is in these areas where now our population is very diverse. Uh, and to not just invite them to be part of the army, but to be included uh, as full-fledged Salvationists in the Salvation Army. And so hopefully our voices at the table can allow that to be a seamless transition as we invite uh, different individuals to come and to come join our army. I think our territory can rise to the challenge. We will have to challenge ourselves, but it's not beyond us if we really want to do that. We've already received phone calls from officers and soldiers who are very excited about the Army moving in this direction. And so I see it as a benefit for all of us in the Salvation Army. We hope that Patty and, and my, uh, not only in this appointment, but the majority of our appointments since leaving the Corps uh, will blaze a trail for others to follow. This evening, we have the pleasure of receiving Marian, Major Marion Platt 
back again as he shares with us part two of his opening keynote. If you were with us this morning, Dr. P Major Dr. Marion Platt shared with us his presentation on Apostles and Advocates, Democracy to Diversity. During this presentation, which he entitled Apostles and Advocates, Geniality to Gentiles, which is taken from Acts 21, Mar Major Marion has more to share about the history of inclusion within the early Christian church. He will also challenge us to consider its modern applications. So back to you, Major Platt. Hey, thanks so much, sis. Well, good evening, y'all. Indeed, it's good to be with you again, and I hope that this day has been as rich for you as it has been for me. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to speak about my own life for just a moment, and then I'd like to pick up somewhere near where I left off this morning. I want to first convey to you that I am a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. I claim him as my Savior and my Lord. I believe that he was the Son of God, that he existed as a Middle Eastern man 2,000 years ago, and that his life demonstrated a new and living way that's unlike any other belief system. I believe that the Jesus of history knew no sin, but was made to be sin, so that those who choose him by faith may claim the righteousness of God. I believe that Jesus died having been arrested by an empire, accused by religious folks, and nailed to a cross just outside Jerusalem. And that three days later, he rose, and soon after, he appeared to his followers. <clears throat> Moreover, I am an American through and through. The blood of enslaved Africans, Native Americans, and Confederate sailors courses through my veins. Both my grandfathers, the black one and the white one, served their country honorably, and so did their grandson, me. I have no allegiance to any other nation or any other form of government. Finally, I'm a Salvation Army officer, educated by Nazarene professors and serving in an appointment in Memphis, Tennessee, in the Southern Territory. I tell you that because whenever I speak about the intersection of faith and race and politics, um, someone may have questions about my allegiance, my belief in democracy, my politics, my theology, my faith in Jesus of Nazareth. But it's out of my faith in Jesus that I believe God is calling the church to examine and excavate its own history in order to boldly present a message and display manners that are consistent with our calling in this cultural context, and that in everything that we do, we will be holy and as such anti-racist. Now, I see that also included among the explicit goals of the Racial Justice Summit. As I read them, they say, led by the Spirit, we will continue to work together in being a diverse, inclusive, anti-racist army. I want you to know I can sign on to that. And I celebrate that goal with you as an invited insider guest. Now, this morning, we chatted about a formative incident that occurred in the church when she was just a toddler. At the time, there were essentially two cultures of people who were followers of the way. Both of them were Jewish, but one of the groups, the Hellenistic Jews, felt that they were more out than in. And in a display of Holy Spirit wisdom, the Hebrew leaders of the church asked the diverse contingent of disciples in Jerusalem to select seven deacons from among them. Now, Scripture seems to suggest that those selected by the church were Greek, every last one of them. 
And I don't want it to be lost on you that those first deacons had as their primary responsibility, not necessarily distributing food as is sometimes preached, but they had the duty of ensuring inclusive practices within the early church. Have you ever thought about that? But by the time we get to Acts chapter 21, just 15 chapters later, I want you to know that some 30 years have passed. And now there were discussions going on about the place of completely non-Jewish cultures within the newly forming Christian faith. That topic of who's out versus who's in persisted in the church. Can you believe that? And you would have thought we would have had it settled at Acts chapter 6. Well, that was mostly because Gentiles, strangers, and foreigners had been coming into the faith, being baptized, and subsequently filled with the Holy Spirit. And during that conversation that was going on in the church, it seems that, carried along by the Spirit of God, one Saul of Tarsus arrived on the scene. Saul, whose Hellenized name was Paul, was born into a wealthy Jewish family in modern-day Turkey, in Tarsus. Now, Paul was the son of a Roman citizen who was also sent to Jerusalem to be trained by the famous rabbi Gamaliel. And while he was there, it seems that Paul learned how to build tents. Now, Paul was orthodox and conservative in his Jewish upbringing and training. For instance, if you read uh, Philippians 3, Paul describes himself as a Hebrew of Hebrews, emphasizing that he had been circumcised on the eighth day, that he was of the people of Israel. Specifically, he says that he is of the tribe of Benjamin in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. The Apostle Paul, when it came to his Jewishness, really was second to none. He, like other Hebrews, saw himself as heir to the law and the prophets. But it seems that as a Christian theologian, he was quite liberal for his day. And because of that, he was murderously disliked among most Jews, the Hebrews and the Hellenists. It seems that any time Paul showed up, a riot would break out among the good religious folks. You see, Paul had a certain view of God's intention for the world as it related to diversity. Being educated as a Pharisee in Jerusalem under the hand of Rabbi Gamaliel, Paul certainly would have been familiar with Isaiah's prophecies, like Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, which we mentioned this morning. It says, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. And As a believer in Messiah Jesus and an anointed missionary of the way, Paul believed very explicitly that his work was connected to Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, as he and Barnabas explained to their Jewish opposition in Acts chapter 13, when crowds showed up as they usually did to argue with and accuse Paul Paul said this, Acts chapter 13, verses uh, verses 46 and 47. He said, well, Barnabas and he said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, pay attention, we now turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord commanded us, I have set thee for a light to the Gentiles, to be a means of salvation to the very ends of the earth. Now, here's what the problem was. In Paul's era, the dominant view of Jewish believers was that no Gentile could come to faith in God and follow Jesus without first converting to Judaism and obeying the Torah, obeying the Jewish law. Even 
Hellenist Jews in that day, the Greeks, they didn't want throngs of unconverted, uncircumcised Gentiles in their synagogues. Can you imagine what they were saying about Paul's theology on the chat groups of his day? Well, he's left the faith. Obviously, Paul's gone astray. Was he ever even one of us to begin with? Priscilla and Aquila must not have discipled Paul very well. They must have said all of those things, but I want you to know that Paul was made for this calling of apostolic advocacy. Reading the, the annals of the Acts of the Apostles would show you that Paul was a kind of sociologist who understood the times and the culture. Even taking a look at Acts chapter 21, you'll find that he speaks a few languages. He was an incredibly skilled orator and understood the deeply held beliefs and assumptions of other cultures and other people groups. He was once even mistaken for a North African, an Egyptian. Let that sink in. And also, as a Jew, thoroughly trained in Torah, he could enter synagogues and the temple and interact with those who had their faith in common with him. As a Roman citizen, he was able to travel the empire and go about his work of preaching the red-hot gospel to anyone who would hear. And his upbringing in the dense diversity of Tarsus equipped him to serve as an advocate for an entire people group non-Jewish believers, and work to, listen, eradicate any barriers to their inclusion in the Christian faith. So, for what appears to be that exact cause, eradicating barriers, by the time we get to Acts chapter 21, Paul sensed a deep compulsion to go to Jerusalem. And if you were to look in uh, Acts chapter 20, you would find that he wanted to get to Jerusalem by a certain time. He said he wanted to get there by Passover. But Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 24, he said to those around him, and now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now, his counterparts were very concerned that Paul would go to a place where he was so hated. Um, the church at Tyre urged Paul through the Spirit not to go to Jerusalem. Acts chapter 21, verse 4. A prophet by the name of Agabus took Paul's belt from him and made handcuffs, saying, The Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt. Acts chapter 21, verse 11. Luke and other disciples wept and begged him not to go to Jerusalem. Luke chapter 21, verse 12. I find it interesting that in Luke's gospel, he also identifies the fact that Jesus at one time resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sees that same thing happening in Paul. And Luke had a great reason to beg Paul not to go. Why? Because he was going too. But Paul's response to all of them, he said, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, they gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. You see, Paul wanted to go to Jerusalem because he believed strongly that the Christian faith was for Gentiles as well 
as Jews, that God's grace transcended these cultural boundaries and these barriers that men were trying to put on them. And he was willing to risk his life. Listen, he was willing to risk his life for the sake of breaking barriers, destroying divisions, and advocating for the inclusion of Gentiles into the faith. Leaders, listen, he was committed up to his life and reputation, to breaking barriers, destroying divisions, and advocating for the inclusion of the Gentiles. I often think about General Booth and his case for the inclusion of women in ministry. You know, he had to go against prevailing understanding in order to do that. In Who Are These Salvationists? There seems to be a link suggested between women in ministry and the salvationist approach to the sacraments. When the founders were moving toward commissioning women preachers, it seemed that one of the main questions was whether women could also preside over the sacraments. Could they baptize and serve communion to men? And around that time, the decision was made to prioritize the preaching of the gospel over the performance of symbolic practices. So breaking barriers, destroying divisions, and advocating for inclusion is part of our salvationist birthright, ain't it? And for that cause, Paul went to Jerusalem, and that's what brings us to our scripture focus for tonight. In Acts chapter 21, verses 17 through 26, Luke who, remember, begged Paul not to go, writes, When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done, listen, among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said, uh, Paul, you see how many thousands of Jews have believed? And all of them are zealous for Torah. They've been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. What shall we do? They'll certainly hear that you're here. So do what we tell you to do. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know that there is no truth to these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, and from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. So the next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. So I present this information to you this evening to help you understand that discussions about diversity and the necessary courageous advocacy of leaders and apostles is not a new phenomenon in the church or some, some kind of uh, contemporary occurrence for 2020. This isn't new, friends. It's over 2,000 years we've been talking about inclusion and diversity within the church. It's a vital part of our understanding of church history and the intentions of God. It's what he wants to produce in us and through us. That beautiful vision in Revelation where every nation, tribe, people, and tongue is gathered before the throne and saying salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's what God is working on. And human nature will always designate dominance to one group or the other. But the inclusion and empowerment of outgroups will require ongoing Holy Spirit empowered humility and strategic ongoing intentionality. Well, 
without the historic, revolutionary, inclusive intentionality of Paul, the Turkish apostle, my Anglo friends would likely have still been pagans, worshiping sun, moon, stars, and rocks in the glades of Europe. The historic Christian faith doesn't have its roots in Europe, but it has historic shoots in Europe. Why? Because of inclusion, geniality to Gentiles. Are you getting it? That's what it took to get the gospel from Asia and Africa to Europe. A commitment to intentional inclusion, a posture of hospitality and geniality to Gentile people. Paul was not ashamed about the gospel's reach, and he said so. Now, after that survey of Paul's biography, think about the context of the book of Romans. For instance, let's look at chapter 1, where he introduces himself. He even gives his job description. Here's what he says. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith, for his namesake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Wow. You know, by the way, he's writing to Gentiles, not the Hellenist or Hebraic Jews that we were talking about this morning. He's talking to people who were formerly pagans, who knew nothing about God. Paul had to appeal to nature to help them to understand who and how God is. Verse 13, he says, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but I've been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I'm obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks. In some translations, it says barbarians. I kind of like that. Both to the wise and the foolish, verse 15. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. Listen to this. It changes the context of this verse. We sing about it. We recite it. We say it all the time. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. It is the power of God that brings salvation. Not Torah, not works. It's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, says Paul, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Now, Paul wanted everyone to know that the gospel was good news to Jews and Gentiles alike. It was good news to Jews because Jesus came with the new covenant promises of God. He came with the evidence of the Holy Ghost, the resurrection of the dead, the promise of eternal life and abundant life on earth. But the gospel was also good news to Gentiles because they too could be included and participate in the blessings without first becoming Jews and taking on the total body of Torah. You see, Paul was willing to risk his name and his status and even relationships during this social and theological dilemma that was happening. Thanks be to God for choosing Paul to be his courageous representative to and advocate for the Gentiles, offering them welcome and inclusion. Thanks to Paul for staying the course, not giving in to peer pressure and dogmatic demands and insider intimidation, but for being a relentless defender of his own people, the Jews, and those of us who, had it not been for him, would remain on the outside. I love this passage of scripture here. Um, 
I, I happened to find it uh, a little bit earlier today. Um, I was I was able to kind of read forward a little bit to get the passage in context, and I I love this. So Paul and uh, Barnabas are arrested, and uh, Acts chapter twenty two. Acts chapter 22, verse 19, um, Paul is speaking to them. He's speaking to all of the Jews who have gathered to argue against and to persecute him. And he's surrounded by Roman guards. So everybody's just trying to behave themselves. They don't, you know, they're not rioting right now. They're just in protest, right? And so he was talking about um, Stephen, the martyr, Acts chapter 22, verse 20. And he said, And when the blood of your martyr, Stephen, was shed, he's talking about his experience there, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. This is Paul giving his testimony. He said, look, this is, I used to persecute the church, okay? Um, I was standing there while they were preparing to uh, kill Stephen. Verse 21, (laughs) Acts chapter 22, verse 21, it says, Then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Now, you got to see this. Everything is quiet. Paul is surrounded by Roman soldiers. There's, There's people everywhere who are still just irate with Paul. And they're listening quietly to him. Acts chapter 22, verse 21. He's telling his story and he says, Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Look at verse 22. It says, the crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then (laughs) they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live (laughs) just for inclusion. Crazy, right? Leaders, I want you to know. It is for such a time as this that you have been placed in your seats to lead us in evaluating the landscape and negotiating any kind of barrier to inclusion. And I want you to understand something. It's not in any kind of opposition to the gospel, but in obedience. To the gospel. I want you to know also, conversation's been going on for 2,000 years or more. It's far from over. But you have to stay the course because inclusion is at the heart of the history of our faith. And chances are you might hear some bad reports about you, you might be subject to criticism and ridicule because of what you're doing. But based on what I read in Acts chapter 21, you'll be in good company as led by the Spirit. You lead us in continuing to work together toward being a diverse, inclusive, and anti-racist Salvation Army. Let me pray with you. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We pray, O Lord, that you would continue to keep our hearts open to the work that you are doing to present a more inclusive gospel that calls all people, all men, women, and children to you. We acknowledge tonight that it is with loving kindness that you have drawn us. You, Lord Jesus, are irresistible to us. Help us, O Lord, to follow hard after you, to learn of your ways, to be like you, and to advocate for those who are on the outside. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Amen. Thank you so much, Major Platt, for your encouraging words, your challenging Frankly, I just feel like I just went through a theological course right now. Those words were so rich to my, and, and so good for my soul and helping and my mind to help me understand God's intention for inclusiveness, that this is not a new thing. 
that, but that indeed, this has been from the very beginning. And one may even talk about from the beginnings of the, the early Christian church, but even beyond that, from the very beginning, beginning, this was always, always God's idea, not ours. And so as we move toward inclusiveness, diversity, and anti-racism, we're simply doing God's will. We're simply making it possible, setting up the conditions for that to happen. One of my takeaways um, from Major Platt's message to us tonight uh, really comes in the form of a question to you. Uh, he talked about how resolute um, Paul was in heading toward Jerusalem and drew a parallel to how Jesus was the same way. And so I wonder, when was the last time you exercised such a, a resolute focus about the ministry and mission of God to the poor, the marginalized, the least of these who he so cares for? When can you just call up in your mind the last time you had such a, a resolute focus to do the will of the Lord? And maybe it's not in, th in this area of racial justice, but that God is calling you perhaps to officership. That this platform that has been established by God to do his will is available to you. And perhaps you're running from it. Or you, you, you've been saying no to it, but it won't leave you alone. It may be that God is speaking to you and saying through this platform of the army that as you link up the gifts that he's given you to this ministry, that even greater things we will do. So I, I challenge you with that as we bring our time to a close. Before Colonel Patty Richardson comes up to bring us our closing prayer, I just want to remind people to... Um, Remember to join those who have not already, the Facebook group, um, Salvation Army Racial Justice. I think I got an essay, Racial Justice, um, on Facebook. And, uh, and a lot of dialogue and great things are being said in there and being challenged and uh, just some great open communication. And uh, this is not just preaching to the choir. This is an opportunity for us all, even those who think we, we know and we're, you know, we're on the right side of this issue. Uh, um, my understanding has been even further expanded and, um, and for the better. And so join us in, in our Facebook group where you'll find a community of people who have brings different perspectives and, uh, uh, to this conversation and uh, that I think is going to be so enriching to us all. So now receive Lieutenant Colonel Patty, Patty Richardson for our closing prayer. Pray with me, will you? Father, we have heard much today. We have experienced much today, and our hearts and minds are full. And as we rest this evening and we reflect on that which we have heard, we pray your Holy Spirit would challenge us where we need to be challenged, that your Holy Spirit would encourage us and strengthen us where we need to be encouraged and strengthened and that you would give us the resolve to be committed to doing better, to doing what we can to be your kingdom here on earth. And so dismiss us with your richest blessing. Keep us this evening and bring us back again tomorrow to hear what the Spirit wants to say to his church. For we ask these things in the strong and powerful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Good night.